This is Gary Carburetor. I've been making YouTube videos for over 11 years now, adding up to 1,100 videos now, and I hardly ever got personal in those videos. That's because I make videos for you, for your health. It's not about me. But here we have a special occasion, more rare information that I just want to put out there. Because at this time, I am now the age that my father was when he died. I've been wanting to mention that. It was kind of disturbing to be approaching that age. And as I've been thinking about this for the last couple of years, I've created a big picture. And so it's worth making a video about. There was a time, I barely remember it, when my father seemed to have money. So it seems he went from the American dream in the 70s to poor in the 80s to dead at the end of the 80s. How did that happen? That's one of the things I want to get out here. I'm not putting all the blame on America here. I'm just telling what happened to my parents and therefore what happened to me. It's weird for me to remember. Actually, I don't remember. It's probably early 70s. I heard from other members of my family that my father was once a pilot. He flew those single engine planes as a hobby. He was doing that in the late 60s when I was born in 68. And two years later, our family moved to California. And these days, I'm aware that California is an expensive place to live. So that may have been a problem. It reminds me of something that happened in the YouTube vegan community. About eight years ago, Vegan Cheetah moved to California. Yeah, people were telling him that wasn't a smart idea. You gotta have some money and a decent job, which he didn't have. He was making all his money off of YouTube, and he had this quick but superficial fame. Famous. <laughs> I'm still laughing at the TV. <laughs> Uh, he ended up living in a van <laughs> down by the river. No, at the beach. <laughs> and then he started doing van life videos. That's a thing. That was a thing. And that could have been part of the problem with my parents. I don't remember my father having a real career. My parents did have something happening, some business, running a music store. I have a big memory of that store. But that was gone by the late 70s. Another reason I knew we had some money is that we used to take trips, renting a motorhome, going to places like the Grand Canyon. And my, my father filmed a bunch of home movies of those trips. He had one of those big movie cameras, big by today's standards. That must have cost some money back then too. But I never recall our family actually having money. What I remember is, well, by the 80s, when I was a teenager, we didn't have enough money for anything but rent and food. All I had was the smallest of TVs, black and white, until the mid-90s is when I got into color. And I had a record player, but real cheap. That was back when the, uh, the Walkman tape player came out. But I had to do without that stuff. For instance, my favorite band, Rush, I only bought Rush albums and only had like a third of them. It was uh, Permanent Waves from 1980. I didn't get that record till 84. I never got Farewell to Kings until the late 90s when I found it at a thrift shop. But I had no problem with this because I didn't know anything else. I was not spoiled and therefore I ended up appreciating everything so much, anything I had. Oh, another thing is, we usually lived in safer neighborhoods, which were more expensive. So the money went into higher rent. But rewinding a few years back to 1980, that is when my father got divorced on by his wife. Now, to this day, I don't have a good reason for why the divorce happened. There was no abuse that I could recall. I don't even remember any yelling. Also, my parents never hit their kids. You could call them pacifist, I guess. And in turn, us four kids never hit each other. Just about never. And maybe that's why I grew up being anti-violence. With the mindset that violence should be last resort. When I think back that the divorce happened in 1980, that was at the end of the decade known for women's liberation. And my mom happened to be a lifelong feminist. And there was this culture going on. Women's lib. They got to free themselves. They even had a song. A song, people. <laughs> it was used in a commercial.
I didn't know that song went back to 1958. Well, you don't have to look so dramatic about it. Things like this happen every day. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair and send him on his way. Get the picture? I'm gonna wave that man right out of my arms. I'm gonna wave that man right out of my arms. I'm gonna wave that man right out of my arms and send him on his way. If the man don't understand you, if you fly on separate beams, waste no time, make a change, ride that man right off your range, rub him out of the roll call, and drum him out of your dreams. And then somewhere in the 70s, oh, 1980, or it could have been before that too. But from this, you can see that there was already a culture going on of pushing men out. My gray hair makes me feel so old. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wash that gray right out of my hair. I'm going to wash that gray right out of my hair. Loving Care Color Lotion from Clairol washes away your gray and washes in your own natural color. Loving Care is different. It's gentle. It has no peroxide or ammonia. So I wash that gray right out of my hair. Well, that's not a big deal. But I recall the original song coming back. And now I'm seeing here that there were some female singers that were singing the song, getting into the full swing, the culture of male bashing and trashing. And that is okay to do. It's actually good. They seem to be celebrating the ditching and trashing of men. And now fast forward eight years later, my father dies at age 55. People seem to be wired to presume that when a woman asks for a divorce, which is most of the case, 80% of divorces, it's because, you know, the man had to have done something so bad and just made the woman's life so miserable. And yeah, I'm going to show this clip one more time, because it fits so well here, and then I will retire it and move on. Stop the rhetoric that a woman is crazy or difficult. If a man, if a man says to you, a man says to you that a woman is crazy or difficult, ask him, what bad thing did you do to her? I just caught that for the first time. Did you hear the people laughing at first? Yeah, because that's ridiculous. That's a code. That's a code word. He is trying to discredit her reputation. Shut the hell up. Did you hear the people laughing at first? And then other people in the audience started cheering louder to cover them up. She basically just said what a lot of other women have hinted at. The idea that women can do no wrong, that they are somehow naturally above human. People seem to be wired to presume that when a woman asks for a divorce, it's because, you know, the man had to have done something so bad and just made the woman's life so miserable. But this woman who divorced my father, she is still alive 36 years later. She's now 83. Who had a worse life? One reason I'm bothering to make this video is because of all the stuff I have to say, which is partly inspired by me taking the red pill a few years ago and getting into the men's rights community, men's rights activists will say stuff like, men are the most negatively affected by divorce. And hyperbole, like the majority of the casualties, well, that's not ours a figure of speech. We are more likely to die when we are poor, and divorce makes men more poor and we're also more likely to die when we are stressed out. Emotional distress, which I was aware that he had. He didn't have a heart attack. Uh, he wasn't fat at all. I'm told he died of pneumonia. And I'm a health expert. That's what my channel's about. And you can't just blame pneumonia or some disease. His body wasn't able to fight it off. So yes, I am suggesting that his death may have been caused in part by my mother. <laughs> and the divorce culture created by feminism. I could say my parents were bad parents, but they didn't really do much parenting. Yeah, that was bad. I ended up poor like they were. 
I also had the poor social skills, which may partly be from growing up in that environment where no one in my family really acts normal or <laughs> how you would see on TV. They didn't really raise me. I and my three siblings. This is amazing. None of us ever had kids and never will. Since the youngest one is now 48 and female, so the family tree will end. And it looks like it will end with me, since I'll probably outlive the other three. And that's because of my healthy vegan diet. A diet high in fruit, as a matter of fact. That's the healthiest part. You can hear my excitement when I talk about my diet and healthy lifestyle. That's one of the only positive things I was able to do with my life. And I didn't get a career. I wasn't able to go to college. And I wouldn't have wanted to anyway, because my social skills were so poor. Antisocial, unsocial, introverted. I didn't like being around people, didn't like being in school, so I could only put my energies into personal things. I did learn a lot about what I would have wanted to do in a career, like science, physics, astronomy, space travel, and health and diet. After 29 years as a fruit-based vegan, I still have a passion for veganism and take pride in my accomplishment. At least every other day in the YouTube comments, I'm telling someone how long I've been vegan or fruit-based. When I was a kid, I didn't realize that I had a dysfunctional family. It's all I knew. It seemed normal. If I like being a loner today, maybe it's because it feels comfortable to me. I don't know if it is natural for me or if it was nurture, but I can't change it now. An example of how dysfunctional we were, well, sometimes I got the impression that my family was crappy. One thing was how I found out that my father had died. Right, people, I was not told. I found out weeks later, when I was walking through the living room, my mom and brother were talking. I guess they were talking about my father. And my mom turns to me and says, Oh, Gary, did you know that your father died? And after a while, you think, well, what about a funeral? Was there not a funeral? I guess not. And now that I think about it, well, I have a funeral because I, I don't think anyone would be there. Not only would no one in my family be interested in going, I don't think he had friends either. And any other relatives were back in Massachusetts. Morning Breakfast Clubbers, how do you? Oh, toast! My favorite kind of bread. Have you forgotten about the hearing? Oh yeah, I got everything taken care of, see? I resigned. Mrs. C, oh. do you have any jam? You're quitting? You're turning tail funds? You're going belly up? I've got my reasons for what I'm doing. Is that right? Name one. Uh-uh, jam first. Oh, yes, here, Arthur. Oh, thanks very much. Okay, here's a very good one, okay? Yeah. Being dean of boys happens to get in the way of my leisure life. Fonzie, you're full of it, Joni. Oh. Hey, that's very fine talk. You use that mouse when you teach? You'll love that job. Admit it. Okay, Joni, I admit it. I love that job. Going down there every day makes me proud. Being dean of boys is like the greatest thing ever happened to me, but so what? So what's the point that one lousy jerk can take it all away from me? I saw this episode of The Defenders, right? Where this guy wouldn't testify for himself. So E.G. Marshall got his friends to say how he couldn't possibly have committed the crime. Did he win? I don't know. My mom sent me to bed before the jury came back. <laughs> Show. He did win. And then his wife left him and he killed himself. Oh, that's why we watch comedies. <laughs> so anyway, that will wrap up this video. I look forward to hearing what you think in the comments below, as I rarely get personal, so this will be interesting to see what people think.